But the race wasn't to the swift, the battle wasn't to the strong. Is that time and chance? Happens to everybody. Isn't that your experience in life? I think as we ponder life and we think about the things that go on, we go, amen, brother, that's absolutely true. And no more did we ever realize that than that Tuesday morning back on September 11th, 2001. We live in a country that has privileges and experiences things that probably no other generation prior to at least the American generations have experienced. And one of those things is an awesome sense of security which was shattered to bits that morning as you sat back and recall it. And I was just talking a little bit before the service with a few folks thinking, you know, how old were you when that happened? Now, I was 43. That didn't sound like so long ago. But a lot of little youngsters that are in the audience this morning weren't even born yet. And some of them weren't even starting school yet, and some of them might have been in the first grade. And you start looking at, at some of the younger folks and think, you know, 10 years ago, you weren't but four years old or six years old or eight years old. It gets to seem like a long time, doesn't it? But it hadn't been that long, and in a sense it has been a long time. We get kind of comfortable with things. I want to remind you just very briefly how that morning went, because what happened was, in this particular case, 92 people got up to go about their daily routines. In this particular case, they were going to take a flight, and so they took American Airlines Flight 11. I don't know where they were going, vacation, go to see Grandma, doing business trips or whatever. But you know what happened at 846, they crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center and their life was ended quite brutally. And following that, of course, 65 people had boarded flight uh, line 175. And again, they had all their various ideas and their plans and whatever it is they were gonna do. But at 9.03, their world came to a sudden stop. And those people that went to work at the Trade Center Almost 3,000 of them, 2,500 of them. You know, these people, I don't know any of them. I know somebody who knows somebody that knows somebody that died in the World Trade Center. I don't know anybody, but you know, they were just folks like you and me. Now, they were from up north, so they talk different. But other than that, they were just regular folks. They got up, they made their coffee, they ate their bowl of cereal, they sent their kids off to school. They got up this Tuesday morning going, oh, is it only Tuesday? I'll be glad when Sarah gets here. We're going to have a picnic. We're going fishing. We're doing that. They just had the same ideas and plans and dreams and hopes that we all do. And the variety that we would represent in this room is quite well represented by 2,595 people. Well, whatever their plans were, time and chance happens to us all. And their plans came to an end. On Flight 77, there were 64 people that boarded it and thought they were going to go do whatever they had planned, but at 9.37, they crashed into the Pentagon, and 125 people on the ground died there too. Just regular old folks doing their job, just like we are, just good old people, and their life was snuffed out in just a moment. And of course, the last one, 45 people were on Flight 93, and somewhere around 10.03, Todd Beamer, who made the statement, let's roll, so popular there for a while. And these people, they were in a more unique situation because what had happened is during the flight, people called them while they were on the plane and said, do you know what happened? And they realized they were a part of the plot. And they got together and said, no, no, we're not. And they brought the plane down and saved probably the White House, though we'll never know that for sure. Thing is, life turns on a dime, and we forget about it. Now today, for a short while, America will do what Ecclesiastes 7, 2, and 3 says. They'll go to the house of mourning. And for a short while, we take this all to heart. Boy, back on Tuesday, 2001, we took it to heart, didn't we? Remember that commercial that said on Tuesday, September 11, our world changed, and they show kind of a, a street down in the old street of America, and then they show the next day, and it's covered with American flags from one end to the other. Remember how it changes for a while? For a while, we were livid. We were angry. We were a lot of things. And we stood up and we shouted and we, we wanted something done. Ten years later, yeah, we commemorate today. And there'll be some tears shed today. And people will ponder this thing today. And Monday morning, they'll wake up. And there'll be a little bit of talk around the coffee pot about it. But for the most part, Americans somehow, and we are really good at this, somehow Americans got back into the routine, did the ostrich thing, I guess, got our head buried just far enough in the sand where we could pretend that we were masters of our universe again, that we were in control. And while this might have happened once, surely this, this won't happen again. And it won't be too many more years. This will be one of those days like um, Pearl Harbor. And you know, it'll be something in the textbooks. And there'll be a few tourists that go by and look at that kind of thing. But it's, it's going to fade. 
just like everything else fades and, and people forget it and get on about their life doing what they do. Well, we need to be sure that we understand as the biblical principle that this emphasizes for us, which is also in James 4, 13 through 15, your life's just a vapor. You don't have a clue what's happening tomorrow. Now, don't get me wrong. I've got my plans tomorrow. I've got my plans scheduled out just about by the hour tomorrow. You've got your various plans, whatever they may be. But the fact is, we don't have a clue whether we're going to actually get to do it or not. Now, probabilities are we will get to do it because I've been doing the same things, routines varied over years, but I've been doing it for 53 years. So the odds are pretty good that I'm going to get my Monday. But one of these days I won't get my Monday. And one of these days, you won't get your Monday. And we don't know when that is. Is that tomorrow? Is that a month from tomorrow? When is it? I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And so what the Bible tells us to do is to be humble and say, if the Lord wills, we'll do this and that. Now, you go ahead and make your plans. Planning is not wrong. Planning is a good thing. But you plan with a sense of humility. I don't know what's happening tomorrow. Now, when 9-11 happened, boy, people, like I say, a lot of folks were angry. And a lot of folks were wanting to know where God was. Remember, there were all kinds of questions and stuff going around about where was God, if this God's so great and God's so good. And, and people were really just beating up on God all they could. And really, given those of us who are professing to follow the Bible, a hard time. Your religion's in vain. Your religion doesn't do any good. Where was God on that day? Well, there's two ways to answer it. One, you could go down a theological technical avenue, which we might do someday, but we're not going to do that today. And then there's a practical way to answer it. And the practical way, and I'm not exactly sure who said it, but the practical answer is, you know, God's a gentleman, and he respects our free moral agency. And when America said, get out, we don't want you anymore, God, being the gentleman that he is, stepped out and left America just as we requested. And, and he's been gone ever since because America still doesn't want him back. Now, that's the short answer. I, I want to detail that a little bit more for you and, and drive it home and give you some Bible basis for, for what I have just said. And I'm going to start with a name that some of you aren't even going to recognize. Some of you are so young, you're going, huh? I was first grader, so when this gal was causing so much trouble, maybe kindergarten, I'm not exactly sure. Been a long time ago, but Madeline Murray O'Hare, she was offended because we were praying in school. Oh, how horrible that we did that kind of thing in a public school. And, and she fought and she went to court and she did whatever she did. And finally, the judicial system, the people in leadership had to make a choice. They had to say, do we want to serve God? Do we want to be one nation under God, indivisible? Or do we want to be a little more considerate of Madeline Murray O'Hare and, and her kind? And guess who we chose? We chose the atheist over God. And so we took God from his more prominent position in our society and we said, no, no, God, don't, don't stand there. You're getting too much attention. Move, move over a little bit. Get out of the way some, would you? And so through whatever various legal systems we went through, we pushed God a little bit off to the side, didn't we? And it wasn't just enough that we took prayer out of school. We certainly don't want anything that looks like the Bible in school. We don't want our kids to be taught, thou shalt not kill and then quote a verse. Now, we don't want our kids to kill, obviously, but we sure don't want to make it a matter of faith. And so we push God a little further aside. We don't want our children to steal. We don't want them to take what's not theirs, but we don't want to connect the idea with God. So we push God a little further aside as a society, as a nation, didn't we? We want our kids to be good to other people, but we really don't want to tie it to a Bible verse, do we? And so we push God a little further aside and said, no, you can't do that. And of course, you've heard all the arguments over the years about the Ten Commandments being posted in public places. And heaven forbid that your loved one down a public highway and you have the audacity to put up a cross in memory of your deceased loved one. Oh, that just offends everybody. And so we pushed God a little further out of our society, didn't we? That's been going on for a long, long time, hadn't it? And it's been going on in some pretty subtle ways that you might not catch. Not Spock from Star Trek. Some of you are going, Star Trek? What? Some of you are going, Star Trek? What's that? Dr. Benjamin Spock. We've got to go way back to the 60s again for this guy. He said, don't spank your children. Now, the kids are loving this, right? He said, don't spank your kids. You might damage them. Well, I meant to damage a certain part of them temporarily, but I wasn't worried about what Dr. Spock was worried about. Incidentally, many, many, many years later, he came back and said, well, I got that one wrong. Yes, he got that one wrong. But when America listened to Dr. Benjamin Spock, we made a choice. You see, God said, if you love your kid, 
you'll whoop the daylights out of him. Now there's several verses like that. None of them says that exactly. One of them says, beat him with a rod, he will not die. Well, that's where I get whoop the daylights out of him. He says, if you love your kid, you'll discipline him properly. Now, we got God on one hand saying, spank the little brat. That's what they need. We got Dr. Benjamin Spock on the other hand saying, oh no, you'll warp their little gentle self-esteem. And we had to make a choice. And as a nation, what choice did we make? As a nation, we started backing off and backing off on disciplinary things. And then what happened? Well, if I'm not going to spank my little baby at home, you think I'm going to let that gruff old coach or teacher or principal at school spank my little precious darling? And then what happened in the school system with discipline? Discipline in the school system. I would have loved to have this one when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I took a few swats and I deserved every one of them. Nowadays, you pull a ticket. You talk too much, pull a ticket. You know, you pull too many tickets, you miss your recess. <laughs> oh, isn't that frightening? I'll tell you what was frightening was Mr. Elder, who was our male teacher and coach who kept the paddle sitting on the side of his desk. And when he said, Phil, come here, you knew it was up. That was the end of that one. There was enough of that when Coach Hart, we got to high school, you didn't want him looking at you because he had a reputation that if when he made contact with the backside, he usually made contact with the floor because he could swat. That was senior high. And so we didn't mess with Coach Hart at all. But nowadays, what do we do? School discipline is almost nil. Um, administrators don't want to mess with it too much. They have some avenues open to them, but it's such a headache and a hassle in the paperwork that um, in-school discipline is probably the more common thing now, which means you've got to sit in a little quiet room and do your homework or play with your iPod or something. I don't know what's allowed in there, but it's nothing like back when we were in school in the 60s and the 70s. And so we chose to push God further out. Now, we've had two or three generations raised like this. They're now out in society. They're supposedly working. That's why we have so much trouble getting a good workforce, because we have no discipline in the home, we have no discipline in the school. We turn out an undisciplined work crew into the public society, and they don't know how to behave, and we're wondering, why is, what's all the problem? Why do we have to have a stop the killing campaign in Pine Bluff? I'll tell you why. It's because we kicked God out of our society all the way back in the 60s and said, oh, don't spank my poor little baby. But now we've got to send him to prison, and we've got to send one to the grave. We made the wise choice, didn't we? We kicked God a little further out. But it didn't stop there. We went on and decided with Roe v. Wade that a woman's got the right to kill her preborn child, no matter what. And um, I know there's some legal variations on this, but pretty much all the way up to the time of partial birth abortions. Now, that, that's a pretty hotly debated in the legal area there. But uh, prior to partial birth, you can find a doctor to do it. You can have a third trimester abortion. Now, God said that he hates the shedding of innocent blood, verse 17. But we looked at what God said. God said he hates hands that shed innocent blood. But we looked at Roe v. Wade's in the Supreme Court, and we said, you know, I think we'll stand over here with the Supreme Court and um, we'll allow that. Now, that's what we did as a nation. And so we took God, and we've had him sometime in the past. We had him a lot better center stage. Now we got him way over here. He's not off the stage entirely yet, but he's moving way out of the middle of the scene and pretty much in the shadows. That's what happened to America. And that, that wasn't enough. Then we decided that our young children needed access to free birth control. We wanted our children to be able to sin, that's the proper word for that, and not have to worry about consequences. We wanted them to have consequence-free consequence -free sin. Oh, actually, it goes a little deeper than that. Now, see, we didn't want them messing up their life with a child out of wedlock before they got out of high school. But you know what we really didn't want? We really didn't want to messing up my life because I ain't going to be raising your runny nose little kid while you're running around as a teenager and I'm stuck home with your baby. You see, it gets kind of deep, doesn't it? Well, that's a lot of the thinking that was going on. And so, as in a nation, we decided, you know, I think kids need access to free birth control. After all, this will keep the STDs down and this will keep the unwanted pregnancies down. And won't that help stop abortion too? You know, and so on and so forth. And so when God said fornicators he'll judge and he said that's sin that's what that is I don't care if it's birth controlled sin or not that's sin but we as a nation said yeah yeah but but we're gonna make it safe sin and we push God further out further off by this time he's getting pretty close to just off the stage completely isn't he but that's what America has been doing for a long time where was God on 9-11 he was right where we told him to be out of our life, out of our business, out of our affairs. And then somewhere along the way, I don't know the dates on this, somebody decided free speech means pornography. 
Now, I, I don't quite make the connection there between free speech and all the smut that goes around, but, but they made the connection. And so our judicial system decided that we can have all that garbage floating around. And now with the internet, it floats very freely around. You know that uh, pornography in America, according to the latest stats, is a $13 billion a year business? $13 billion. That's one of the biggest industries in America. Globally, it's a hundred billion. That's with a B. That's what we've got going. Now, God told us, set nothing wicked before your eye. Psalms 101, verse 3. But now we've got a choice to make, right? I mean, after all, we've got the Constitution and freedom of speech as the judges ruled it. Or do we want to stand over here with God where he says that kind of stuff? He even goes on to say, and I believe it's Ephesians 5, 12, not even to let course jesting go on among you. Now, that's a paraphrase, but the phrase, of course, jesting is mentioned there. And now we've got to stand with God, or do you want to stand with the wisdom of man? You know where we chose. We're standing with the wisdom of man more and more, and God's not even allowed on stage anymore. We've got him so far in the back, we don't even know what to do with him anymore. He's about lost back there somewhere. And then corrupt politicians. Maybe this would be one of the last things we'll look at. We decided as a society... But it doesn't matter how sick, how perverted, how demented, how homosexual, how adulterous this particular politician happens to be, as long as he does his job, then we're okay. As long as he'll make sure I'm going to get my Social Security check when I get to be 65, I really don't care about his personal life. That's what Americans decided. Americans decided that the politician's personal life was his own business. You keep your nose out of it. We don't care what he does as long as he does a good job for us, which means financial security, basically. Now, the Bible said we're supposed to let our light shine so that people can see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Now, that's what the Bible teaching says. And so on one hand, we say, God says, okay, we've got to be setting a good example. Now, we've got a scandal that's openly gay politicking for office. Who are you going to vote for? Is that the example you want to set before your society and your kids? Well, you know, he's going to do a good job. He's a good politician. After all, it really doesn't matter about his personal life, does it? After all, everybody sins. I mean, no way around that. And so God said, you want people to be exemplary? And man says, no, just as long as he covers my business, okay, it's all right. And God's so far out of the picture that most folks wouldn't know where to begin to find him. Where was God on September 11th? when that first plane hit the World Trade Center, when that second plane hit it, when those 2,595 people who just got up to go to work died, when the plane hit the Pentagon, when the plane went down in Stony Creek. Where was God? I'll tell you where God was. He was out of America exactly where the majority of Americans wanted him, out of here. And then when he left, gentlemen that he is, and this thing happened, or any tragedy happens on a personal level or a national level, well, it's one of the first things people want to know. Where was your God? If he's so big, why did this happen? I just, I just want to shake my head. Isn't it funny how, how we can just rip God apart, kick God out, trash him any way that you can imagine, and then we have the audacity to wonder why our society is going to the dogs. But that's what Americans generally do, isn't it? Isn't it funny how people believe the news media? Well, I saw it on Fox News. Well, I saw it on CNN. You know it was good if it was on CNN, you know. And I don't know who newscasters are anymore. I'd make fun of them too. But, you know, if it's the liberal media and you're liberal-minded, boy, that's the truth. Hallelujah. Now, I know the Bible said that, but I'm not sure about that. You know, if it's the so-called conservative media, then I know, you know, that's got to be the truth. O'Reilly said it. <laughs> like he's a character of moral integrity, nonetheless. We'll believe the news, oh yeah, but when it comes to God, I'm not sure about that Bible. Set nothing wicked before my eye? Are you kidding me? You mean fornication's a sin? Yes, I do. And if God's going to come back center stage, then we have to acknowledge these things are sin and take a stand. Funny how we'll mess around with that kind of stuff. Funny how we'll, we'll spread humor, whether good or whatever. Let's talk about good humor. But Bible truth? Oh, I don't know about that, talking about the Bible now. But did you, did you hear about, the, you know, we'll start telling a joke. This last one. Funny how lewd, crude, vulgar, obscene material passes freely through society, doesn't it? Lewd and vulgar and obscene material passes freely, freely through the mouths of professing Christians. And yet, oh, I don't know about talking about the Bible now. That kind of makes me a little uncomfortable, you know. You're not supposed to talk about politics. You're not supposed to talk about religion. I think I'll just be quiet now. But you hear the one about the farmer's daughter? Let's talk about that. Let me tell you a dirty joke. Yeah, we'll do that. 
but stand up for the word? Don't know about it. And then all of this stuff, this, this all adds up, and this has been going on. I guess Madeline Murray and my list would have been the first one. We could probably go back further than that if we'd really analyze it. This has all been going on since the 60s. And so it's just been sowing and reaping and sowing and reaping. And we want to know why we have to have a stop the killing campaign in Pine Bluff and other cities need the same campaign. We want to know why our kids are irresponsible, why they won't do a decent day's work. I was talking to the now retired Social Security Administrator here locally. And he said he had a young man come in, looked to be about 23, and he said, I need to get on disability. Logan said to him, well, what's wrong with you? And the guy said, well, I get tired when I work. Logan said, you're supposed to get tired when you work. That's the way it works. How did we do all of that? How did we produce a system that has as many prison units as what we have in our own state, in the nation today? You know what's happening? We're reaping what we've been sowing. As a nation, we are reaping what we've been sowing. God said, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You know what we've been doing for 50 years now? We've been sowing garbage. We've been sowing smut, stupidity, ignorance. We've been sowing everything that's destructive, and we've been reaping it. And God stepped back and said, that's what you want, free moral agency. That's your life. Go for it. You know what? September 11th, that was not God's failure. That was America's failure. We're the ones that blew it. Because while we might like to have on our money one nation under God, while we, well, in God we trust on our money, excuse me, it's our pledge where we're debating whether we'll keep the phrase one nation under God. We might like those things, they're nice symbol things. Our politicians even have the gall to have a prayer before they assemble to legislate things that are immoral and vile in the eyes of God. It's crazy symbolism we like, but depth? Do we have spiritual depth as a nation? You gotta be kidding. We have no more spiritual depth than the man in the moon. So, why did we as Americans want to push God out? Why do we keep nudging him out, nudging him out? Well, number one, folks, we're at war. We've been at war. First Timothy 6.12 says, fight a good fight. We've been in a spiritual battle for a long, 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 long time. And fighting's not a whole lot of fun. And so a lot of people just got lazy and said, oh, whatever, my life's okay. I'm not worried about anybody else. I forget who said it, but if you look it up on Google or something, you can find the originator. It said, all evil needs to succeed is for good people to sit idly by and do nothing. Isn't that kind of what Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 and 16 says when he condemns the lukewarm and says, you make me sick, I'm going to vomit you out to the lukewarm? But that, that's kind of what happened. Now, how did all of that happen? I want to hit three points with you rather quickly. Number one, it's because I think opposition. If you stand up and say, that's sin, that's wrong, I will not endorse that, and you draw a line in the sand and say, I'm going to stand with God, do kind of like Joshua did in Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. That takes some courage. That's going to get you some opposition. That's going to get you some persecution. Now, in our society, that means people are going to point a finger at you. They're going to talk about you around a water cooler and talk about you behind your back and say, whoa, he's so judgmental. He thinks he's the only one going to heaven. Well, that's fine. Say that behind my back. I don't think that's really going to hurt. Kind of, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, that's a lie, too. We don't like negative words. We don't want any opposition. We want everybody to like us. So Christ said if we were of the world, the world would love us. But we're not of the world. And we don't like that opposition. You know what? And I, I want it to be kind of personal. We, we have a little problem that the, the rulers had. There comes a point that um, we kind of like to praise a man. You know, this happened to stand alone and be the only one standing up on an issue. You and a book, chapter, and verse foundation is not a lot of fun. And so just like the rulers love the praise of men more than they love the praise of God, I want you to think about it. Doesn't that happen in our life sometimes too? Guys sitting around the coffee table and they're telling a joke that Christians ought not to tell. But then again, they don't profess to be Christian, so maybe that's okay for them. But I do profess to be a Christian, but I don't want to look like the oddball. So instead of getting up and leaving, they're saying, guys, I'm not going to be part of this. And just sit there and giggle along with them, kind of a passive thing, you know. What do we love more? Praise of men or the praise of God? And we need to take those things to heart. Because while we look at the extreme, Madeline Murray O'Hare and Dr. Benjamin Spock and the abortion thing and all those, Sin is sin. Is At least that's what we teach. And there is some sin that we will embrace because we love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And I'm not just talking about the extremes. I'm talking about that gets close to home. And we need to watch that one. This is one reason, though, why God got pushed out. We just got tired of fighting a good fight. We got tired of taking a stand. We got tired of being made fun of and what have you. And then there are challenges. It is a straight and narrow road, a narrow and difficult way, however your translation says it. It's tough to really, really really be Christian. 
And if you're really going to do it the way the book says, it is challenging. And so what a lot of the religious community has done is they've watered it down so much that, you know, it, it isn't much of anything anymore, but they got a big assembly and they got a good program and, you know, they, they're going to have a big ice cream eating afterwards or something and everybody's happy for the moment. Real Christianity is tough and a lot of us don't like the toughness of that real Christianity. And so we, we just kind of go, you know, things need to change. They really do. But somebody else needs to change. Let's call that spectator Christianity. The world is in a mess. America is in a mess. Our community is in a mess. Some changing needs to go on. You know what we do first, didn't it? Well, they need to change over there, and they need to change over there, and they need to change over there. Oh, me? No, no, I'm, I'm doing good. Are you really? Do you really want God center stage of your life? I mean, do you really want God at the core heart of your life? Let me ask you one simple test, and some of you can say, Amen, brother, this will work. Some of you are going to have to go, Uh-oh. Where are you going to be at 6 o'clock tonight? God going to be the center of your life at 6 o'clock tonight? Or is TV, and probably something Christians ought not to always be watching, going to be the center of your life tonight? Wednesday at 7 o'clock, who's going to be the center of your life at Wednesday at 7 o'clock? Now, I know some of you got to work, and sometimes you have to take care of people who have health problems. We, we understand that. But you get my point. It's tough. It's difficult. And Americans as a people are lazy and coddled and fat and fluffy and undisciplined and don't want to do anything that's a little bit uncomfortable. And if I had the audacity to drag this sermon all the way out to about, oh, 1215, we could make an illustration of that because it'd be some wiggling and some aggravating and a long-winded preacher fussing kind of thing. But you take me back 50 years and let me preach a 30-minute sermon and I don't get hired again because I'm not worth the effort. Entertaining, isn't it? And then, of course, the third one is because there's going to be some change. There's opposition, there's challenge, and I'm, I'm really talking about that individual level, and there's change. And we're going to be holy. That's what we aim to do. If America is going to ever get anything back, it's only going to be because individuals do the changing. But you see, one of the reasons we like corrupt politicians so much is because corrupt politicians make laws like it's okay to kill your baby, it's okay to give out free birth control, it's okay to ban the Bible from school, it's okay to be gay and proud of it, and so on and so forth. See, what those corrupt politicians do is they lower the bar, some, well, they don't lower the bar, they take the bar away, and then they stifle anybody like me who would try to get up and say something against it. I'm not even allowed on the radio to deliver the lesson I'm delivering this morning because it would qualify as a, hey, crime because I didn't embrace the homosexual community out there and say, aren't they precious? Hallelujah. Praise Jesus for them. That's, that's what corrupt politicians have done for us, you see. And, and so we kind of like that. It protects us because, well, the law says, well, I don't care what the law says. If you're Christian, then you're aiming to be holy as God is holy. That's what Christians do. And when enough people in America get their mind focused back on God and endeavoring to be holy as God is holy, then America will start to change. But until that time comes, we're in a whole lot of trouble. Because when we tell God, get out, God says, okay, you're free moral agent. That's your choice. I'm going. And he's gone. Isn't that scary? You know, to you and I, to this audience this morning, that's a horrendously scary thought. To most people out there, they're breathing a sigh of relief. Let's bring it to a close. Ecclesiastes 9-11, where we started. Isn't that interesting? Time and chance happens to be 9-11. Interesting coincidence, isn't it? Life has always been uncertain. Look, think about it a second. Now, and you're just going to have to think back, you know. Think about what you know about history, your own experience, if you lived long enough. Right now, today, don't we really have the best material and financial security probably of anybody on planet Earth? I mean, there was a time where you went out and you eked out your crops and you got them in and, and you hoped the rain came and the rain didn't come and the crops didn't grow you might be dead before next spring rolled around. I mean, literally, you might not survive it. Now we've got all kinds of public programs and food banks, and those are all good things. I'm not opposed to them. What I'm saying is we look at life and we whine, and, oh, it's so scary. Come on. Go back 50 years. Go back pre-World War II. Go back 200 years. You won't talk about scary. <laughs> those were some scary times back then. We live in a wonderful time right now, and we ought to be thanking God with every fiber of our being. Politicians. They've always been rotten. That was the whole problem with Israel, is you had judges who would take a bribe. 
corrupt politicians, that's nothing new. And they're going to be there, unfortunately, from now on out. Um, I would like to get rid of them. It's a good theory, but it's commonplace. And society changing, I know we got problems. And I know America needs to change. And I know Pine Bluff does need to stop the killing. I know that's true, too. But I don't think we're near as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't think we're near as bad as the days of Noah when God said, enough's enough. I'm killing them all, except they ate on that ark. I think, you know, there are uncertain times, and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. But I know we live in the best country there still is to live in, and we live in the best time there is to live in. And then if we individually get God back in our life, there's blessing there. And if, and it's a pipe dream, but if in some way we could get God back into America, as Proverbs 14, 34 said, righteousness exalts a nation, then we could be even better still. I know the possibilities are there. And I know it starts with the individual heart. So I close with this question. Do you really? Do you really want God at the center of your heart, at the center of your life, being the main factor in every decision and every choice that you make? Do you really want God to be the God and the King of your life? Or do you really kind of, I want him somewhere on the stage, but I think over there kind of, uh, that, that part of the stage would be a good place for God. It's a personal question. Where do you really want God? When you turn your TV on, where do you really want God? When you turn your radio on, where do you really want God? When it comes to telling jokes and having a little fun with humor, where do you really want God? When it comes to being responsible and doing the right thing when there's fun things you'd rather be doing, where do you really want God? Where was God on 9-11? Exactly where we told him to be. Where's God in your life? Exactly where you told him to be. He'll take center stage or he'll take out. Which one have you made? If God's not center stage of your life, then we ask you to make a change. Make that personal change. If you haven't yet been baptized into Christ, our baptistry is ready. If you've just gotten kind of lazy and wandered off, then make your private changes, but make your changes. Put God in the center of your life. If you're subject to our public invitation, we're here to help any way we can. All together we stand and sing.